This flow chart you should have in your notes. Um, we have actually looked at it once before in the beginning of chapter 7. <coughs> but this, this is going to summarize a lot of what we're going to talk about here in chapter 9. Chapter 9 is the peripheral nervous system. It's everything outside the central nervous system, which is saying a lot. There's a small portion of it that deals with voluntary functions, such as skeletal muscle. And then there's a much larger part that deals with what we call the autonomic system. The autonomic system deals with sympathetic and parasympathetic, which we've talked about a little bit already. Those two are antagonistic in most cases. We will note a couple cases before we get out of this text and where they work together. And one of them is in chapter 20. In reproduction, they actually have to work together. But we have the parasympathetic, which is your everyday, mundane, vegetative activities. Not a lot of excitement going on in the parasympathetic mode. That's kind of like your cruise mode. This is a, definitely not a survival. This is just existing. It doesn't get any lower than that, is what I'm trying to say. But we can kick it up a notch and go to the sympathetic, which is a fight or flight mode. Okay? Now, if we break these, these two down, the first thing they break down into is cholinergic and adrenergic. There's three things you need to know every time you hear the word cholinergic. You need to know that it uses acetylcholine, it's preganglionic, and it's parasympathetic. When you hear the term cholinergic, those things must stick to you. At least long enough to take the test. What did you say again? <laughs> when you hear cholinergic, you're going to need to know it uses acetylcholine, ACH. It's preganglionic, it's parasympathetic. It's right there on the chart. See right there? Oh. Yeah. That's okay. why I wrote it for you. That <laughs> makes sense. Okay. The uh, adrenergic, <laughs> it's Monday already, isn't it? <coughs> Glad we're getting on. See, he's getting a big laugh out of his leg. Adrenergic is norepinephrine, postganglionic, and sympathetic. So those are the three things we need to know with each one. Then as this chapter goes on, it'll break adrenergic into alpha and beta. And you're going to have, I think there is 16 matching questions at the end of this test that's going to give you a scenario and you'll put A for alpha or B for beta and tell me what kind of response that, that scenario is. They're just little short brief scenarios. There's a chart in the chapter I'll point out to you. It's a good study chart that'll warp your mind in the right direction. Isn't that what we're looking for is a warped mind in here? It's in there, not You already warped? <laughs> But you can see in the big picture of things, alpha tends to slow down and constrict. Well, I'll tell you on your matching components, if you just remember alpha constriction, you'll get 85 to 90% of those questions. There's always exceptions to the rules, and that's where your complete understanding comes in to get them all. But that's not that hard, even on Monday. Let's see, you're awake and with us today. Monday's always a good skip day for you. <laughs> Smooth muscle to viscera inhibits things not involved in fight or flight. Exception vessels and skeletal muscle do dilate in an alpha response, and that's simply to increase blood flow to those areas. Beta, speed up, dilation. If you want to remember one thing about beta, just remember dilation. And uh, relaxes smooth muscle and digestive. We put that in there as the exception simply because if, if this is a speed up by relaxing smooth muscle and digestive tract, we're not speeding up digestion. We're literally shutting digestion down, but we're still basically dilating those vessels because we're relaxing those uh, muscles. So not only will that uh, that dilate vessels where we need to increase blood flow to the skeletal muscle, but it'll relax smooth muscle and digestive tract because we're not going to worry about digesting if we're worried about life or death, fight or flight. And that's really where these relate into. If we're in a fight or flight response, 
What basic everyday systems will we not worry about during a fight or flight? Obviously digestion. We're not gonna be running from this scary bear that's been on the last couple tests. Yeah, this would be a good test question with a scary bear. We're not gonna be running from the scary bear and say, oh wait, here's a berry patch. Give me a minute, I wanna eat a few berries before you get them. Because the bear's probably gonna stop and graze and then chase you on down and eat you. That's not gonna be on our mind. Food consumption, no. What else? Nothing else? How about reproduction? You gonna run by a hunk of a guy out in the middle of the woods and say, wait a minute, Mr. Bear? <laughs> I don't think so. Reproduction's not a priority when we're trying to survive. I think it depends on who you ask. <laughs> We're not going to get into the deep exceptions to the rule, those that commit suicide for any reason. So digestion, reproduction, excretion. We're not going to worry about excretion either. Now there is a, an exception to that one. If you're in extreme fear, you may <laughs> urinate all over yourself. So, and they'll tell you that one in the book too. So there are extreme cases. So. That's what this is setting up for us in this chapter nine. So going to the book, I'm gonna show you where they're gonna talk about that. I'm just gonna turn that off for now. And they start on page 240 and talking about autonomic neurons. And uh, there are some of those that deal with somatic motor neurons that deal with voluntary control. They're just a small portion as you saw on that, on that chart. Now if we look on over on 241, they get into visceral effector organs. Visceral effector organs, where's that at? It's all internal digestive processing is what it is. Visceral is dealing with smooth muscle. Because the autonomic nervous system helps regulate the activities of gland, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle, autonomic control is an integral aspect of the physiology of most of the body systems. Autonomic regulation plays roles in endocrine regulation, smooth muscle function, functions of the heart, circulation, and in fact the remaining systems are all listed in here to be affected at some point or another. Now, those are the, the ones that stand out the most but if one system is needed, sometimes the opposing system will not be needed. So if we're in a fight or flight, we're gonna shun all of our blood over here and we're not gonna be digesting. We're not gonna be excreting. We're not gonna be reproducing. <laughs> Depends on who you ask, she says. Unlike skeletal muscle, which enters a state of flaccid paralysis, an atrophy when there's no motor nerve severed, when their motor nerves are severed to it, the involuntary effectors are somewhat independent of innervation. In other words, these that are closely associated to the autonomic system will work on their own, even denerved, even the nerve severed. And if uh, we take a nerve to a skeletal muscle and sever it, that skeletal muscle has no innervation, therefore, it atrophies and goes away. Nerves to the digestive system, we sever those and it knows what it's supposed to do and sometimes by severing the nerve, they actually get it back to working properly. So here they give an example. Let's see, damage to an autonomic nerve makes its target tissue more sensitive than normal by stimulating agents. This phenomenon is denervation hypersensitivity. Such compensatory changes can explain why, for example, the ability of the stomach mucosa to secrete acid may be restored after its neural supply from the vagus nerve has been severed. This procedure is called vagotomy and sometimes performed as a treatment for ulcers. Sometimes the nerve gets overstimulated and it overworks itself, it overdoes what it's supposed to, and, or in other cases it may not do anything, but when we sever the hindrance of the nerve upon that organ, then the organ goes back to doing what it's supposed to do. That's why it's called part of the autonomic system, because in our mind, it's almost automatic. We don't have to think about it every day or it'd be messed up. We can't think about what we're supposed to do anyway, much less what our system's supposed to be doing. 
So in addition to their intrinsic or built-in muscle tone, cardiac muscle and smooth muscle take their autonomy a step further. These muscles can contract rhythmically even in the absence of nerve stimulation in response to electrical waves of depolarization initiated by the muscle itself. So we can actually sever every nerve around the heart and it'll still function at a standard pace. And it'll function as long as it has oxygen at that standard pace. So that's one of them. Moving on over to 242, the sympathetic division. The sympathetic division has its own chain of ganglia. In fact, uh, they call it paravertebral ganglia or the sympathetic chain of ganglia. Basically what it is, is we have normal highways for nerve impulses to travel through. And then we have a sympathetic chain that only emergency vehicles will travel down. It's like having a highway going from here to Worcester and the old Highway 112 is just for emergency vehicles. Nothing else supposed to travel it, so we're not going to have grandma that's got uh, rock and roll cranked up and driving 20 mile an hour blocking the ambulance from going down the road because nothing else is going to be on the road. There's no hindrance for the sympathetic chain. When that response kicks in, it is a mass activated response. In other words, several people get called at the same time. In this case, several responses get triggered at the same time to make this happen. Over on uh, 243, it says divergence occurs within the sympathetic chain of ganglia as preganglionic fibers branch to synapse with numerous postganglionic. And then we have convergence occurs here when a postganglionic receives synaptic input from a large number of preganglionic. And all this creates this, what I just referred to, mass activation. It's not, we're going to try to fix this with one little thing. It's mass activated. Adrenal glands are going to play a huge role in this simply because of epinephrine, adrenaline. I mean, there's things we do on adrenaline that cannot be explained. It's, uh, I loved a commercial I saw one time. This elderly lady was walking back from the store, and she wasn't walking very swift. She was shuffling her feet. But you know how elderly people, when they go to the store, they buy just a little bag, something they're craving at that time, and maybe something else they had on their list, and it's just a little bag. And, well, this lady had a half a gallon of ice cream, and then whatever else was in it, just a small bag, but she dropped her ice cream, and it rolled underneath the vehicle parked at the curb. And boy, it just took her forever to get down and take a look, and finally, Guess where the ice cream was? Right in the center of the vehicle where no, you can't reach it from any direction. And she's looking around for help. There's nobody around to help. So she finally walks around the traffic side of the car where she can really get down and see it. But instead, she just lifts the car up and grabs the ice cream, drops the car, and goes back to shuffling her feet back home. Now that's how much she liked ice cream. That was a surge of adrenaline that allowed that to happen. Now, do you like ice cream that much? Yes. Do you? I don't know. It was a, I want to say it was a Blue Bunny ice cream commercial. I want to say that's what it was. But you had to have a little science background to understand the, what was really going on with her. But epinephrine and norepinephrine, as we know, epinephrine is, is the uh, hormone. Norepinephrine is the in, the uh, neurotransmitter involved here. And they are considered to be complementary. Complementary. So all this creates a mass activation of what they are now calling the sympathoadrenal system. Sympathetic with adrenaline gives us mass activation. Sympathoadrenal system. On page 244, they list in a couple of tables here, 9.2, 9.3, some comparative structures of sympathetic, parasympathetic, and even in 9.5 there's some. It should be noted that most parasympathetic fibers do not travel within spinal nerves, as do sympathetic fibers. As a result, cutaneous effectors, blood vessels, sweat glands, and erectile pili muscles, and blood vessels and skeletal muscle receive sympathetic but not parasympathetic innervation. 
what they're saying is some things don't get told what to do, but they know what to do in the absence of being told. <laughs> Nothing. Just get out of the way. That's what they're that's what they're being told to do. Now if I strictly come to you and tell you to do something, then that component knows exactly what to do. If the other's not told what to do, it just keeps doing what it's doing or nothing. So we already have it out of the way. And that's and they're fixing to break into uh, some specialty areas here before this chapter's out. On 247, they're basically saying the same thing they've been saying. They've got the fight or flight response, which is the mass activation of the sympathetic adrenal system. Emergencies is where this is going to kick in. We've got the heart rate increases, blood glucose rises, blood is diverted to skeletal muscle away from viscera and skin. What organ of the body can take the least amount of blood at any given time? y'all knew this one. Skin. Yep. And it's probably the largest organ as far as surface area, but it can take the least amount of blood at any given time. And when you're exercising, what does your skin feel like? Would you agree? Mm -hmm. We've got the evaporating effect from sweat, which is basically peeing all over yourself. <laughs> We've already covered that one, haven't we? Okay. So, cold, clammy skin. That tells me there's not much blood supply in the skin right there. Now, we had to have a little bit to get the sweat. So what we had was a diversion of blood only to the sweat glands, and that's caused by a chemical called bradykinin. And they'll probably mention that, if not in this one, in the next couple chapters. Brady Cannon allows for blood flow to the, to the sweat glands only. Rest of the skin, none. And the sweat glands produces the sweat through evaporated cooling. Now, after exercise, just pretty quick after exercise, actually, I mean, you've stopped your exercise, your heart rate's still up. Respiration's probably still up a little bit, but your skin starts getting a red tint to it and starts warming up. It's because we're not directing blood flow to the skeletal muscle, which was necessary for exercise, now we're starting to direct it back to the parasympathetic organs, the parasympathetic responses. So they're gonna talk about that a lot in 1314. So 247, this uh, adrenergic, cholinergic, what are the three things you need to know when you hear the term cholinergic? Uses acetylcholine. Preganglionic. Preganglionic. Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic. How about adrenergic? Norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. Postganglionic and sympathetic. Postganglionic and sympathetic. There at the end I was hearing blah, 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 blah. But that's all right. All right. Uh, looking over responses to adrenergic stimulation on 249. I'm going to explain some of their terminology in here a little bit. The heart, dilatory muscles, the iris, and the smooth muscles of many blood vessels are stimulated to contract. The term contract can be misleading here. It literally means constrict. Okay. The smooth muscles of the bronchioles and some blood vessels, however, are inhibited from constricting. Adrenergic chemicals therefore cause these structures to dilate. So in, a, in an adrenergic sympathetic response, we would dilate vessels going to the skeletal muscle and the heart. We would constrict the muscle, the vessels, put it that way, I said muscles, constrict the vessels going to the digestive tract, going to reproductive tract going to excretory system. We would constrict those because those are not involved in us surviving a certain situation. 
So two classes, alpha and beta. Look on 251, and they give us some examples. And this is where I kind of got my idea of doing all these matching questions. The, the, the book encouraged this. So. Stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors promotes the relaxation of smooth muscle in the digestive tract, bronchioles, uterus, but increases the force of contraction of cardiac muscle and promotes an increase in cardiac rate. So the diverse effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine can be understood in terms of fight or flight. Adrenergic stimulation wrought by activation of sympathetic division produces an increase in cardiac pumping. Is that about alpha or beta? beta? It says beta. A vasoconstriction and thus reduced blood flow to visceral organs. Constriction, mm -hmm. notice it said constriction, alpha, correct? Mm -hmm. Dilation, do I need to even finish that one? No, beta. What is it? Beta. beta. Dilation of pulmonary bronchioles is beta. And all this preparing the body for physical exertion. So again, a lot of it's based off constriction. Now, the only one that will get you is when it says uh, uh, relaxation of smooth muscle to the digestive tract. That's still a beta response. Although it's relaxation, technically it's still dilation because if they're relaxed, then they're not maintaining a tone. So it'd be the same thing. A drug that binds to receptors for neurotransmitters and that promotes the processes that are stimulated by the neurotransmitters is said to be an agonist. An agonist promotes. An antagonist inhibits. In the next couple of tests, you'll have agonist antagonist questions. And all you have to do is understand what those terms mean. An agonist promotes. If I give you thus and such drug that increases cardiac rate, would that be an epinephrine agonist or an epinephrine antagonist? It would be an agonist because it's promoting what epinephrine already does. Antagonist, we know all about antagonists. That term was based off marital problems, the term called nagonist. <laughs> did I put that on film? Yes, oh. you did. Maybe nagonist was based off of antagonist. Maybe that was the case. Mm -hmm. What would we do without it, though? It's an intricate part of a marriage. All right, moving on to the next page. And they tell you. If we're trying to dilate something and we give you a medication that constricts it or stops dilation, that makes an antagonist of it. So opposing antagonist, promoting agonist. We really get a lot of those questions in the circulatory chapters. You'll like those. Response to cholinergic stimulation. All preganglionic neurons and most postganglionic parasympathetic neurons are cholinergic. They release acetylcholine. Cholinergic effect of postganglionic parasympathetic axons innervating the heart slows the heart rate. In general, the effects of parasympathetic innervation are opposite to the effects of sympathetic, which we've already noted, but there it is in the book. If you stick acetylcholine in a heart, if it has any effect at all, it'll slow it down. If you stick acetylcholine in skeletal muscle, it'll aid in dilation and uh, excitatory response for muscle contraction. You stick epinephrine out in the muscle, may not respond at all. Stick it in the heart, we get excited. So, now on 253, they re innervate your acetylcholine nicotinic receptors and uh, muscarine nicotinic receptors. And I think we've already identified the fact that this is where nicotine is addictive and uh, it can replace your own acetylcholine and that muscarine is not overly addictive because it just takes a little bit of it to kill you. <laughs> but it'll replace your acetylcholine so you won't be addicted to it very long before you won't have to worry about it anymore. It is a poison from a mushroom. Moving on over. 
254, organs with dual innervation. Most visceral organs receive dual innervation. They are innervated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic. And it would make sense. If we don't have a sympathetic response going on, then parasympathetic's working, isn't it? In fact, you can make this as a true statement. Parasympathetic works only in the absence of sympathetic. Sympathetic has complete override. It is your emergency medical system. So parasympathetic only works in the absence of a sympathetic response. Now, sympathetic responses are, aren't necessarily always good for us long term. They get us through temporary situations. Because increased heart rate, you're going to increase blood pressure, aren't you? Because we're forcing blood to go. We don't have enough blood to go everywhere. That's why we have to shun it to different places. So would stress not trigger a sympathetic response from time to time? So if stress triggers a sympathetic response, is it good to have a long-term sympathetic response? No. That puts pressure on the heart. That puts pressure on all the vessels because we've increased blood pressure. We've increased heart rate. Uh, we're made for short-term sympathetic responses, not long-term. Antagonistic effects, <clears throat> the effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation on the pacemaker of the heart is the best example of antagonism, definitely. This chart on uh, was it table 9.7, this is your table you need to study for alpha beta. <clears throat> and you can see the action. And they got a squiggly line for alpha and they got a B for beta. I took a lot of my examples out of this chart. Okay? So study this chart. And again, a lot of it comes back, and you'll see in the third column over there where it's contracting or constricting. Remember I said contract the same as constrict or dilate. Or they'll say accelerate or decelerate. Under antagonistic effects on 256, a reverse of this antagonism is seen in the digestive tract where sympathetic nerves inhibit and parasympathetic nerves promote intestinal secretions. The effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation on the diameter of the pupil of the eye. Which one do you think dilates the eye? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Sympathetic is going to dilate the eye to allow more light in so you can actually see better in a fight or flight response. Complementary and cooperative. This is kind of review from an earlier, earlier chapter. The effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation on salivary gland secretion is complementary. Now, <clears throat> has a little different effect here. You can see a, a parasympathetic response would be us leaving class at 11, driving down Main Street, and start smelling different eateries producing food, whether it be Pizza Hut or Mazio's or some place smoking meat out on the side of the road and you got all this smoke on it and it just smells good. What do we start doing in a parasympathetic response? Salivating worse than Pavlov's dogs, right? In a fight or flight response, we actually shunt away from salivary gland secretion. In a fight or flight response, you would have a, a uh, you ever heard the term cotton mouth? A dry mouth effect? That's what, that's what they're going to tell us here. The secretion of watery saliva is stimulated by parasympathetic, which also stimulates secretion of other extra glands in the digestive tract. I mean, by the time food hits your mouth, the rest of your digestive tract is so ready for it. It's just waiting because mentally you've been primed. Here, you order what your favorite food at a restaurant and have to wait 15 minutes on it or 20 minutes. It just kills you, but your whole system's about to eat itself up waiting on that food. That's parasympathetic. Now, if somebody hollered fire and a blaze shot out of the ceiling of that restaurant, you would suddenly forget about what you was fixing to eat, wouldn't you? Stomach may go ahead and digest itself, but you, you wouldn't be thinking much about it. 
I don't think while you're running over people getting out, you think, dang, I was this close to having my favorite food tonight. I don't think that would cross your mind, but it could. It, probably, it depends who you are. Yeah, you're just, uh, there's a name for people like you. Smart, creative, funny. It's not what I was thinking. <laughs> Sympathetic nerves stimulate the constriction of blood vessels throughout the digestive tract. The resultant decrease in blood flow to salivary glands causes production of a thicker, more viscous saliva. So there it is. Complementary. Effects of sympathetic, parasympathetic on reproductive and urinary systems are cooperative. Here, here's one that I said is in chapter 20. They're going to go ahead and point it out here that for in reproduction, for an erection, you need a parasympathetic response. For ejaculation, you need a sympathetic response. So they have to work together. It's one of the few cases in which they actually work together, and they are considered uh, to be cooperative in their response in the reproductive system. They're also cooperative in the female as well. There's also cooperation between two divisions in micturition. This is the only other case in which they cooperate in the process of uh, draining the bladder. Micturition <laughs> is the same as urination. Although the contraction of the urinary bladder is largely independent of nerve stimulation, it is promoted in part by the action of parasympathetic nerves. It's a lot easier to pee when you're relaxed, isn't it? If somebody's holding you at gunpoint and say pee, you'd be uh, under a little bit of stress. You probably would uh, have a little stage fright going on there, wouldn't you? So, yeah, fight or flight, I'm not really interested in peeing. Now, if you scare the weebie jeebies out of me, I may pee on you too. That's the extremity of that, and I think they actually mentioned that in the next section. The micturition reflex is also enhanced by sympathetic nerve activity, which increases the tone <coughs> of the muscle. The sympathetic division acts in cooperation with parasympathetic division in control of micturition. Emotional states that are accompanied by high sympathetic nerve activity such as extreme fear, may thus result in reflex urination at bladder volumes that are normally too low to trigger this reflex. So that's extreme fear going on right there. Organs without dual innervation. One or the other is going to be acting on them, but not both. Most organs do receive dual innervation. There are just a handful that don't. These include adrenal medulla, erector pili muscles, you ever seen the hair stand up on a dog's back? You ever felt like the hair stood up on the back of your neck? You ever get that scared? That's erector pili muscles. These receive only sympathetic responses. Sweat glands. You're not even exercises, but you're so scared you break out in a cold sweat. And most blood vessels, just sympathetic response. So they use this case in a, in a deal here in an example of non-shivering thermogenesis. Non-shivering thermogenesis is the burning of brown fat, burning of your stored fat to produce energy. That's part of your sympathoadrenal system. If you're out here borderline in uh, hypothermia, you think your uh, fight or flight system is going to kick in to try to save you? Sure. It's going to shunt your blood to your internal organs. Increase energy exertion by burning uh, stored energy. And uh, so your pinky freezes and becomes frostbit and snaps off in a couple hours. Are you still alive? Yeah, you're alive without a pinky now. End of your nose falls off. Are you still alive? Absolutely. You're just a little maimed now. <laughs> but the purpose of the system is to keep you alive. You lose a couple of toes, you lose your ears, you lose the end of your nose. And your lips don't work like they used to. You're still alive. That's the bottom line. And that's where this system comes into play. Genetically, all your pieces and parts are still there. I'll give you a good example of this. I bought a young bull one time from a guy from Stillwater. In fact, he teaches at OSU. And this bull was born in one of the worst snowstorms ever in that area. So I think it was in the early 2000s is when it happened. And so both his ears were frostbit off. I mean, he just had little stubs for ears. And we was kind of joking fun at that. And 
I said, boy, I don't know. Uh, you know, you really shouldn't charge me. The whole bull's not there. You really shouldn't charge me as much as you charge. You know, I was, I was harassing him, and he was harassed. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll guarantee his calves to have full-fledged ears. And that's what he did. And of course, we laughed about it, but genetically, his ears are still there, aren't they? Just because he got frostbit off, he was still alive. That's what counts. Hello? Okay, just a second. All right, uh, moving on down from there, uh, sympathetic system itself is required for proper thermal regulation responses. In a hot room, uh, decreased sympathetic stimulation produces dilation of blood vessels in the skin, which increases cutaneous blood flow and provides better heat radiation. During exercise, by contrast, sympathetic activity increases, causing constriction of blood vessels to the skin and limbs and stimulation of sweat glands in the trunk. So, if you're relaxed in a hot room, a steam room, then your skin is going to be red to look at and hot to the touch because we're dissipating excessive heat your body's absorbing. If you go exercise, we're going to shunner blood to the skeletal muscles and away from viscera and skin so your skin's cold and clammy. We're still going to dissipate heat by way of sweat. Sweat glands also secrete this Brady cannon. There it is. In response to sympathetic stimulation, bradykinin stimulates dilation of surface blood vessels near the sweat glands, helping radiate some heat. As a conclusion of exercise, sympathetic stimulation is reduced, causing cutaneous blood vessels to dilate. This increased blood flow to the skin, which helps to eliminate metabolic heat. Notice that all these thermal regulatory responses are achieved without the direct involvement of parasympathetic. You ever get finished with exercise? or you've been doing something and just real sweaty, but you gotta go somewhere, so you jump in the shower, take a quick shower, and you wash all that sweat off, only to sweat when you get out of the shower. We've done that, we've all done that before. It's because your body's still cooling down. You probably jumped in and took a hot shower. Made it even worse. But uh, even after you clean yourself up, you got out and peed on yourself again. <laughs> That's terrible. Moving on to 257. Man, I get to cover a lot of material with y'all because y'all just laugh and go on. You know, no comments here at all. Control of autonomic nervous system by higher brain centers. Well, that's arguable, isn't it? <laughs> Who's higher brain center is going to kick in here? Oh, the medulla. The water boy's favorite part of the brain. The medulla of got him. You know why those alligators is ornery? They got all them teeth and no toothbrush. But it's the medulla that, that creates the biggest problem, according to the water boy. And that's where I lost that show because it was not scientifically correct. That's, a, that's where they screwed up the whole show in their, their explanation of the medulla. That was sad. It's a good show. Not like boy. really anybody knew. Well, were you expecting to learn something scientific from that movie? <laughs> Consider the source. True. They probably didn't do it because they I mean, Adam Sandler. Come on. Y'all ever watch, uh, oh, what's the name of that show? Uh, I can't think of it now. It's about, it's about, oh, it's something Joe. Joe Dirt? No, but no. Joe Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't Joe Mama either. Uh, I'll think of it one of these days. It's, it's, it's been out so long, y'all probably haven't seen it. It was more of an animation, oh, no, no. but it, it, it hit the box office and sold pretty good, but it was, uh, it, it, it was internal. It was something traveling through the system and going through all the process. Osmosis Jones. Osmosis Jones, that's right. That's I was going to say Magic School Bus. <laughs> no, well, you're so close. <laughs> Osmosis Jones. Anybody seen that one? I don't know if you can even get your hands on it anymore, but that one was about as scientifically correct in what they did throughout the whole show. I'd even, I've even been known to show it in a biology class lab before uh, when we was talking about digestion and go through the whole process. And of course, while we was doing that, we was eating popcorn. So we was making our digestive system function too. So what an educational experience that was. But that, that movie is pretty correct. All right, now, they want to talk about the medulla on 257 with the brainstem, which controls autonomic activities. 
control cardiovascular, pulmonary, urinary, reproductive, digestive. They're all located here. And then, of course, the hypothalamus is going to stick a finger in there somewhere. Contain centers for control of body temperature, hunger, thirst, regulation of pituitary gland, various emotional states, as we said earlier, working with the limbic system. Then they throw the limbic system in the next paragraph, is a group of fiber tracts and the nuclei that form a ring around the brain, it includes the syngiculate gyrus and the cerebral cortex, and then it says it includes the hypothalamus, and that's not true. So you can just put right there beside the hypothalamus, not because it's not part of the limbic system. It works with the limbic system, like it said in previous two chapters. Now, the hippocampus is probably part of it, and the amygdala nucleus is probably part of it. And we know the amygdala is because that's what we uh, ablated when monkeys went from being afraid of snakes to playing with snakes in our research. So the limbic system is involved in basic emotional drives such as anger, fear, sex, and hunger. And it even goes on to explain that blushing, pallor, fainting, breaking out in a cold sweat, or racing heartbeat and butterflies in the stomach <coughs> are only some of the many visceral reactions that accompany emotions as a result of autonomic activation. Do you choose to blush when somebody embarrasses you? It's embarrassing to become embarrassed, isn't it? If we could control that, it'd be a lot less embarrassing. That is a limbic system, autonomic response you have very little control over. Do you want to faint? Yeah, I think I'll just faint take myself out of the picture here and won't have to worry about it. Well, it might be a nice escape one of these days, but you can't just make yourself faint and you can't stop it when it's fixing to happen. It's all instinctive. It's all built in to you. And every system's wired differently. We've noticed that, haven't we? Everybody's wired a little different. On 258, the last page, <clears throat> studies indicate that aging is associated with increased levels of sympathetic nervous system activity. Somebody can, somebody can take, go their whole life and not have hypertension. When they reach a certain age, what do they end up taking pills for? Hypertension. Why? Sympathetic nerve activity. More of it. Okay. This represents an increased level of tonic sympathetic tone in healthy adults, not an increased response to stress. In fact, most of them are probably less stressed. They've been there and done that. They're older and wiser in most cases. There's a lot to being said by saying I've been there and done that because, of course, teenagers think their 35 or 40 year old parents are idiots. They've been there and done that. So they may think they're idiots, but their experience says they're not. It's like if, if I was traveling uh, from here to Oklahoma City, and y'all are leaving two hours behind me, and I'll call you and say, hey, there's been a major wreck right here at Seminole. You're going to have to go around this. Is that, am I stupid telling you that? Or have I been there and seen that? It's the same response. It's the same, same probability, if you look at it that way. So older and wiser in most cases. There's got to be some that don't get wiser with age, but there's some you wonder how they got that old and still alive. But older and wiser to most, yes, because they have been there and done that. It has been suggested that higher tonic levels of sympathetic nerve activity may promote increased catabolism generating heat and helping to combat the greater amounts of adipose tissue in the elderly. You notice how older people tend to lose weight and they end up pretty skinny? Now, there's some that may pass away before their time and the catabolism does not kick in, but I, all of my grandparents, I've seen pictures of them in middle aged, and they were pretty good sized people. They weren't obese, but they had some stored fat for the future, put it that way. And when they died, at, my grandmother died at 92, her mother died at 89, my granddad died at 83, but I, I never saw any fat on my granddad, even in earlier pictures. He was just an extremely active person working all the time. But those people did not die with any stored fat. Catabolism burned that fat for energy form over time 
Chronically elevated sympathetic tone may increase the risk of hypertension, and that's where it comes into play, and cardiovascular disease, that's where hardening the arteries comes into play with older age. So there's, there's a part of nature that happens to us that's really not reversible. It, we can slow it down to an extent, prevent it? I don't think so. I don't think we can prevent it, but we can give different medications at a lower blood pressure. But do we have any medications that'll actually stop the sympathetic tone? We have some that affect the sympathetic response, we do. But are we gonna make it go away? It's going to keep on keeping on until eventually it gets us. But we may drag 10 more years out of it with today's technology and, and medicine and, and the ability that we have to respond to that. But uh, earlier detection, the better. Some people kicks in a sympathetic tone and their heart can't take it or, or small vessels can't take it and they end up with a stroke or a heart attack or something like that's going to kick in. And you have a higher chance of blood clots with, with toned vessels as well. So there's many things that goes with old age. It's not, it's not pleasant with old age, but we're all going to get there eventually, whether you like it or not. Any questions?